Alrighty, greetings everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the neurobiology of psychiatric disorders. Understanding the biological basis of behavior is important because it allows us to create a better picture of what mental disorders are all about. According to the Society for Neuroscience, there are eight core concepts that every person should be familiar with. Okay, today we're going to be talking about four of those concepts, and next week we're going to be talking about the other four concepts. So concept number one, the brain is the body's most complex organ. The brain is responsible for regulating the activity of other organs, such as lungs, heart, liver, and many other organs among the body. Okay. Not only is it responsible for regulating the activity of these organs, but it's also responsible for integrating information from the outside world, processing that information, and emitting a response. We also have language centers in the brain and, and centers specialized uh, for emotion as well, such as the limbic system. Now, the fundamental unit of the brain is known as the neuron. Okay, Our, a typical human brain has around 86 billion neurons. Okay, we also have other specialist, uh, specialized cells in our brains, such as astrocytes, microglia, and oligodendrocytes. We can, we can consider these cells as support groups for the neurons. Okay, now concept number two states that neurons communicate using both electrical and chemical signals. Okay, before we go into this, this concept, I want to emphasize that neurons contain three typical areas. We have the dendrites, which are these uh, hair-like structures coming out from the soma, or body of the, of the cell. This would be the soma, and the axon. Okay, information usually travels only in one direction, from dendrites to the soma, and from the soma to the axon. Over here we see this axon making another connection with the dendrites and even the cell, the cell body as well of another neuron. Okay, now you may ask, well, what, what is causing the, the activation of this neuron? Well, neurons are going to have specialized channels that respond either to light, pressure, chemical, or electrical signals. In this case, uh, neurons are typically, typically have what we refer to as voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay? They're voltage-gated because they activate as soon as the voltage changes. And uh, we call them sodium channels because they let sodium go into the cell. When that happens, we have a, we have a transmission of a signal. Okay, so we can see uh, that the signal is traveling across the dendrite until it reaches the body. Now, sometimes the signals are not powerful enough. Or they're, they're far away from an area known as the axon hillock. Okay, this axon hillock is very important because a lot, a high density of voltage gate in sodium channels is present in this area. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to overcome what we, what we often refer to as threshold. Okay, we want to we wanna be able to send a signal so the threshold has to be overcome. Okay, but the signal has to reach the axon hillock. And from the axon hillock, it's going to propagate in, in this direction until it reaches the synapse. Once again, communication from neurons is going to travel in an electrical manner all the way until we reach the synapse. Okay, at the synapse or the synaptic left, this will be the axon terminal of the first neuron that we were talking about, and this will be another neuron. Okay. We can see that as soon as the as the signal hits the axon terminal, we're gonna have a series of, of chemical uh, signaling 
that occurs and leads to leads to the release of neurotransmitters. Okay, these little structures over here are known as vesicles. Okay, and, and typically these vesicles contain neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, or other signaling molecules. As soon as these are released into this area, they, they are able to bind to different receptors. Now, depending on the type of chemical that we have, depending on the type of, of neurotransmitter that we have, uh, each one activates a, a specific type of channel. So in here in this diagram we have uh, two different type of channels and uh, one of them would be activated by by one of these guys in here. Okay, these are known as neurotransmitters. Okay? Now, it's important to keep in mind that some of the neurotransmitter that is not that does not participate in this activity goes back into the cell and it gets recycled again. Okay, you may ask, well, why why is this uh, why why is this uh, neuro why are neurotransmitters important? Well, because they can lead to the excitation or inhibition of the of the next neuron. Okay, so they are, it's a way of sending messages. Okay, here we have uh, again some of the neurotransmitters that we have. Okay, and for the most part, we're gonna divide them into two categories excitatory or inhibitory. Okay, an excitatory neurotransmitter is something that excites the, the neuron that it's communicating with. Okay, making it more likely to send the signal. An inhibitory neurotransmitter, on the other hand, it's gonna inhibit the the propagation of signals. Okay, glutamate. We have glutamate in here. Is the most abundant neurotransmitter in the. I'm sorry. This is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. The most abundant neurotransmitter in the brain is GABA, and this this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Glutamic acid or glutamate. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. Now we often refer to this this neurotransmitters as being either excitatory or inhibitory, but in reality, there's no such thing as excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters because their action depends on whatever channel they bind to. For example, dopamine can either lead to it can sometimes act as a excitatory or inhibitory depending on the channel that it binds to. Okay. So concept number three states that genetically determined circuits are the foundation of the nervous system. Okay, it is important to know that neural connections are established during development. In here we have an example of the dopaminergic system. Okay, we have two regions of the brain that are responsible for innervating the rest of the brain okay so we we're gonna have a lot of dopamine producing neurons in these two sections one of them is known as the substantia nigra and the other one is known as the BTA or ventral tegmental area okay this pathway over here is known as the mesocorticolimbic system because it starts as because it innervates the prefrontal cortex and the limb and the limbic system as well this other pathway is known as the nigrostriatal system because it, inner, it is responsible for innervating the striatum. We have learned that genetic information is responsible for establishing neural connections, but concept four tells, tells us that life experiences can in fact change the nervous system. A few years ago, many experts believed that brain that the brain was a fixed system with fixed number of neurons and that it was impossible to change. Nowadays, we know that new connections can in fact be made with, with existing neurons. This concept is known as neuroplasticity. We also know that some neurons are generated in an area of the brain known as the hippocampus. 
The following picture comes from a study conducted in adult rats. One of them received no visual stimulation while the other one received visual stimulation. Okay, these are segments of dendrites and what the little the little things that we see in here, those are dendritic spines. As we can see, those dendritic spines are more common and larger in size on, on this side on this side on, on the rat that received visual stimulation. Now you um, why is this important? Well, because if you have a bigger surface area, the, these guys over here, what they're doing is they're increasing the surface area. So more connections can be made. All right. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you, and we will continue our discussion next week.